Good morning, everybody. It's March 29th, 2022, and welcome to Triggered. I'm Corey Morgan. This is the Western Standards Live Daily Show. We run at 11.30 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, sharp every day, Monday to Friday. I don't do holidays, though. Either way, columns, comments are welcome all the time. I, I just like to keep reminding everybody of that. I like seeing those comments coming in there. I like seeing discussion between the viewers. Throw some things my way. Sometimes I don't necessarily read them all out, but I do read them all eventually. And uh, we can get some questions out to guests when we can and such as well. And I got some great guests today. Uh, Conservative Party of Canada leadership candidate, Dr. Leslie Lewis. Again, unfortunately, it's hard with these candidates with a live show. We recorded that one, but it was only recorded like 20 minutes ago. So it's as close to live as you can get. You can certainly discuss while that interview runs. We're going to talk to all of them as the leadership campaign goes. I mean, eventually one of these conservative leaders is going to be our next prime minister. So it's important to listen to them. I like to think eventually anyways. We're also going to check in with Matthew Horwood. He's our parliamentary bureau chief with the Western Standard. And uh, he was looking at the protests that are firing up again in Ottawa as they did last weekend. And he'll give us an update on that and other stories he's working on there. Crystal Whitrongle. She's been on before a couple of times. She's with the Montreal Economic Institute. And they put out a, a, a column and talking about the Bay de Nord oil project. It's a huge one. And it's just off the coast of Newfoundland. And it's hanging in the air. Uh, we don't know if the Liberals are actually going to approve that one or not. It's not just Alberta that is getting hooped by the crazed green government we have right now. So I might as well get on to uh, what's got me ranting this morning. And good morning, all you guys. I see that Brenda and Gary and Kathy. It's good to see you. Uh, I walk to work from my parking space every day. And unfortunately, sometimes I find inspiration for my daily rant from it. So last week, a young woman was randomly attacked and murdered in, in the Calgary downtown Beltline area. And then last weekend, another woman was at least allegedly grabbed at knife point while walking through a downtown park in the evening. as She escaped being dragged down to the river by her, her assailant. Crime in the downtown area of Calgary has been on the rise for years. Much of that crime has been of a violent nature. Our political leaders, though, particularly in the municipal realm, and the police forces guided by them, don't like saying crime, though. That's too harsh. They like to say Social disorder. Well, 31-year-old Vanessa Lettiser wasn't social disordered to death. She was murdered. And it was part of rising crime in the area. The first step our political leaders need to take in dealing with this is to stop trying to sugarcoat what's going on. The next fluffy term civic leaders like to use is vulnerable persons. You see, the crime spiking in these areas where they're spiking in the areas where vulnerable persons are known to gather. So let's not beat around the bush and uh, get, let's get back to calling vulnerable persons what they are, homeless people. And let's quit pretending that homeless people are predominantly folks who have fallen upon some short-term hard times due to the economy or the evils of heartless capitalism. Most of the people we see on the streets and urban centers are there because they're addicts and or they have mental health challenges. I don't want to demonize people with addiction and mental health issues. They're human beings and they need our help. I can't count the number of times I've written on or spoken of the need for availability for more comprehensive treatment centers and, and resources for the addicted and people with mental health issues. And to their credit, Kenny's UCP has made great progress and they've been investing in these areas. The progressive set, however, likes to cloak themselves in this world of denial. They feel if we could just facilitate addicts enough, they would somehow kick the habit. Safe consumption centers have become almost a religious thing to them. Hey, I'm supportive of harm mitigation. We can't treat addicts if they're dead. And if safe consumption centers can prevent some overdoses, that's great. Getting back to reality, though, most of the addicts don't use the safe consumption centers. And I took some pictures this morning on my walk. I didn't have to go out of my way to find these. These are discarded syringes. I see them daily, and it's only a few blocks from the local supervised consumption center. I don't blame folks for not wanting to do it, but... <laughs> If there's any doubt about how bad it's gotten downtown, just take a walk through a few alleys and look into some of the recessed doorways and the many closed businesses. You'll find no end to the discarded drug consumption paraphernalia and human waste. You could put a supervised consumption site on every block. There still would be a large number of addicts who just don't want to use them. So supervised consumption centers as well, they become a haven and a hangout for many addicts. Go walk around the Sheldon Schumer Center, uh, especially on the south side. You see them all sitting out there in the sun and, and shooting up. Like any other kind of parasite, the drug dealers, of course, follow them and seek out their hosts. Safe consumption centers lead to increased crime, not just social disorder, crime in the neighborhoods where they are placed. That leads me to the next area of denial. Addicts and people with mental health issues aren't necessarily harmless. They can and often are very dangerous. 
Matthew DeGrood had a mental health problem. He murdered five people. And I know most people with mental health problems don't murder people, but let's quit pretending it doesn't happen. Even if an addict is responsibly using a safe consumption site, they still have a very serious problem. They're addicted and need to find ways to feed their addiction. That often means ranging out and stealing from nearby residents. Anybody claiming that Beltline property crime hasn't spiked since the safe consumption site was placed there is either lying again or in some form of denial. Cars are chronically broken into and nothing of value can be left out for a moment without risk of it being stolen. People understandably don't want to confront these thieves as they can quickly become aggressive. While addicts consuming opiates tend to be somewhat sedate when they're impaired, often dead unfortunately, those strung out on meth or crack can be very aggressive and out of control. And like it or not, they can and do often commit acts of violence against each other and other citizens. Calgary's LRT stations have turned into havens for addicts in the last few years. Ridership continues to plummet because citizens are tired of choosing to have to step over passed out people or being accosted by aggressive panhandlers and then sharing train space with a guy with a shopping cart. Homes within walking distance of LRT stations are chronically being hit by thieves, taking everything from bicycles to catalytic converters. So how has the city dealt with this? Well, they closed a number of LRT stations to the public. Taxpayers keep shelling out into an uh, increasingly expensive transit system that they can't even access indoor train stations in a winter city because the city doesn't want to deal with the root of the problem. The city's also begun checking for train fares now. How controversial. How daring. They're actually asking people to show a ticket. Welcome to the realm of denial. You know, many people weren't choosing to pay their fares. Who'd have thunk it? But again, that's that city of Calgary thing. They just didn't want to deal with it. Calgary's downtown's in an almost dystopian state, state right now under a decade of foolish city management that won't deal with hard realities. The city continually claims that they want to attract citizens and businesses into the city core, but they won't address one of the primary issues keeping people away from it. It isn't social disorder, and it isn't being perpetuated by vulnerable people. Calgary has a major and growing urban crime problem, and it's being perpetuated by addicts and people with mental health issues. Myself, I am a recovering alcoholic. I know about some of these things. There's a lot of wisdom in the 12-step program. Even if it's a little churchy for my liking, there was a lot of wisdom. I gained a lot from it. Step one is you have to admit you have a problem. You have to admit you're not in control. No addict in self-denial can begin recovery without facing those realities. Well, no city can begin to repair and recover from their problems until they're ready to admit the nature of their problem either, or that they've lost control. Until that happens, Calgary and a lot of other urban centers are going to continue to become more unsafe and more depopulated. That's what's got me triggered today. So let's talk to our news editor, Dave Naylor, and get an update on other news today. Hey there, Dave. How's it going? It's going well, Corey. It, uh, it truly is uh, like being in an episode of The Walking Dead when you uh, walk to and from work here in downtown Calgary, isn't it? Oh, it is. And it's tragic. It, it is. But I mean, we can't deny it's also discomforting. I mean, some of these guys are, are pretty scary and they're pretty out of control. Yep. So, you know, some people I know uh, uh, just refuse to ride the LRT anymore or, or even come downtown for that matter. It's, it's, uh, it's not a good situation for sure. Uh, On to the news. Uh, our website is currently leading off with uh, two of our columnists. Linda Slobodian uh, has the latest on the uh, uh, the UCP leadership uh, uh, campaign. Uh, she says that uh, Jason Kenney likes to pretend there's nobody else in Alberta that uh, that can lead the party and and unite conservatives except for except for him. Uh, so Linda says he may be wrong on that one, and she goes into some depth on that. Our military uh, affairs uh, correspondent, Dave Makachuk, has a really interesting look at the uh, the F-35s that Canada's in the uh, process of purchasing from uh, Lockheed Martin down in the States. These are like hugely expensive aircraft, but uh, the toys that they come with would, uh, well, makes you want to uh, be young again and become a fighter pilot. Uh, speaking of the city of Calgary, uh, Corey, uh, the first poll on Mayor Gondek is uh, is out today, uh, done by Think HQ, and uh, her uh, polling numbers are in the tank. And uh, the uh, Think HQ people say this rarely happens in uh, in a mayor's first term, and uh, it's got to be worrying uh, for the new mayor. Uh, speaking of polls, uh, we've got a story on a Nanos poll that shows Jean Charest is uh, favored by most Canadians. 
uh, conservative voting Canadians as their next leader. He's uh, heavily favored down in Ontario and Quebec. Uh, on the prairies, it's uh, Pierre Polyev, uh, who's already been out here a time or two uh, during the campaign. Uh, we've got an update on uh, the Sas uh, Saskatoon uh, masking bylaw uh, from uh, our uh, Saskatchewan correspondent, Christopher Oldcorn. He's got the results of uh, last night's meeting on uh, on uh, how the city will continue with their mask mandates. Uh, what else have we got, Corey? Um, the big emissions today, uh, the big story this afternoon that uh, our, uh, you'll be talking to Matthew Horwood on is the uh, climate change announcements by uh, radical environment minister, Stephen Gelbo. Uh, he's got uh, oil companies have to cut their emissions by 42% uh, over the next eight years to meet targets. So that's uh, certainly uh, something that the patch is going to be uh, have considerable uh, their eye on today. Uh, so it's uh, more fun and games in Ottawa and uh, lots of good stuff coming from this afternoon. Right on. Yeah, another full busy news day. At least, uh, you know, a quiet, peaceful, friendly world makes for slow news copy, but it does make for a better living. But I guess we, we have to report on it, whether it's good or bad. Yep. Hundreds of planes land every day safely, but it's the one that crashes that makes the news. You bet. Well, thanks, Dave. I'll uh, see you after the show and see what else is breaking. Thanks, Corey. So yeah, just that reminder to everybody, uh, all those stories and more are constantly going up on the site. We've been getting so busy lately. It's been great. We got so many contributors, columnists, uh, as the, the opinion editor, I got a couple more I got to put up this afternoon. I just haven't had time to get them rolling and all kinds of news. And it's thanks to you guys who have been subscribing. That's how we're growing. That's how we can stay independent of the federal government and their control. But we need you guys for it. Because that way we only answer to you. And uh it's been great so far, and we want to keep you coming. So if you haven't subscribed already, get on there, westernstandardonline.com slash membership. And hey, everybody likes a good deal. Well, you put in the coupon code TRIGGERED, you're going to save another $10 on an annual subscription. And uh, an annual subscription, you knock that all the way down to $99 to begin with, or it's $10 a month. It's a free trial for two weeks, risk-free. Sign up, check it out, get beyond that paywall, see all that content. And 95% uh, of the people who try it out for two weeks realize this is worth the $10 a month or even less if you take advantage of some of those incentives to get that news as it's breaking and clean and not uh, like our mainstream and legacy outlets that unfortunately insist on being beholden to the federal government. This is the future, guys. Get on and subscribe if you haven't already. And again, thanks to those who have. Just look at some of the commenters. I love seeing all those comments. Just seeing people all over. It's the great thing with new news, you know, being able to reach out all over like this on a new media outlet. We got uh, Ken Shack from uh, Forest Lake, Minnesota. That's a good long haul. Uh, Scott in, in uh, Fort McMurray, Debbie in, in Saskatchewan, Kathy in Rocky. And uh, yeah, lots of people from all over on this. Uh, what's somebody saying? There should be free bars for alcoholics. Yeah, I know. That's, that's what it gets to the point of, right? We talk about addiction. We talk about things like that. And, and I do point out, you know, uh, we got Beth in Michigan, by the way. Wow, we're getting some good... Uh, international uh, attendees, and I appreciate that. But, you know, people call me heartless or get upset sometimes when I talk about the addiction problem downtown, and, and I do. I sympathize. I want these people to recover. I want them to get treatment. I mean, that's the best outcome for everybody. You know, as long as they're addicted, they're, they're, they're going to be going in and out of health facilities. They're costing money. I mean, aside from looking at the humanity and the person themselves, you want to be just a cold, hard uh, capitalist. Well, the costs of having untreated people with mental health issues or addiction are massive in healthcare, in prison, the amount of people who are in jail that probably could have avoided it if they'd had treatment of some kind to get off of whatever they're addicted to or whatever their, their challenges are mentally. I mean, a lot of people can live perfectly functional lives if they have medical treatment and, and are medicated and, and keep uh, straightforward. I've talked about that before. We don't want to demonize people with mental health challenges. It's a sickness like anything else. But we also can't pretend that's the problem. We're pretending that people who are untreated and in that state are harmless, and they are not. Um, downtown Calgary uh, at the City Hall, they, they, they put this uh, uh, thing up, you know, over the, 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 when the, the grave sites were found on residential school areas. And there was a, a fenced-off area, a bunch of teddy bears and shoes and everything were put up from people uh, expressing concern over the whole thing. And, and it was a display. It's still there, I believe. They're not sure what to do with it. And they fenced it now because it was getting vandalized. When it first got vandalized, somebody had lit it on fire a couple of times. 
And uh, it, 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 there was, of course, outrage expressed. This was about a year ago, maybe a little less. And they were saying, oh, I see it's clearly these, these white nationalists and racists going out there and, and burning this memorial. And, and then they suddenly quietly discovered uh, with the video footage, oh, no, it's a, uh, and again, they use their term, vulnerable person who was doing it and actually looked like the person was probably a First Nations heritage. So, again, it's that denial, guys. Uh, you know, you just want to point to things you don't like, but don't like facing the hard realities, that there's some very distressed people, and it's leading to a bigger problem. And we hear about it in Edmonton, as, as Claudette's saying, uh, you know, it's good to hear, see Don there from Nova Scotia. We're going to talk some maritime stuff later with, with Crystal. Uh, this is a problem everywhere. This opioid uh, epidemic is everywhere, and it's a big, big problem. I've got two friends now. No, three. Three friends whose sons have died from, from overdoses or poisoning or whatever way you want to put it. This is awful. Like this stuff is, is eating people up. And it doesn't mean they're coming from broken homes or bad environments or anything like that. They get on the wrong crap, particularly that fentanyl and stuff like that. It just eats them alive. But we're never going to get better until we start addressing where the issue is. And, and we haven't been doing that so far. So uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, before I get to the Leslin Lewis interview as well, uh, one of our sponsors, and that's Bitcoin Well. This is the other way we pay our bills. Of course, we advertise, we get it out there. Hey, we're good capitalists. And, you know, you guys subscribe. The more subscribers we got, the more advertising we can sell, of course, because we're showing that we're getting their messaging out to a lot of people. And if you're interested in uh, sponsoring any content on here, by the way, reach out to me. We'll see if we can't set something up. But either way, Bitcoin Well, these guys have got a great service. I was talking to... Uh, one of their, their heads there, Dave Bradley, the other day on the show, because they are doing great. I mean, digital currencies are a growing thing. They're expanding all over the world, and people are looking to get into it. And But we don't know how. We haven't done it before. This is brand new. That's what Bitcoin Well is about. These guys are there to help you get into the digital currency world safely. It's non-custodial. You always have control of your own money. That's important. You have ATMs all over to make it as practical as possible to Put money into your digital account, into your wallet. Uh, they'll show you how to set it up. These guys are there for you every step of the way. So, I mean, if you're curious about digital currencies, you want to safely get involved in them, you want to get your money, some of your money, away from the reach of the federal government, which we've seen with recent events, we really want to do a bit of that. You want to hedge your bet and get some of it out of their reach. They never got to anybody's Bitcoin wallets, guys. Get away from those banks. These are the guys to help show you how to get there. As you can see, you can pay your credit cards, your utility bills, all sorts of stuff. With digital currency, it's getting more and more practical all the time. Bitcoinwell.com, a fantastic sponsor, a great service, and uh, check them out. All right, and uh, what do we've got? Uh, studies out of Lisbon and Portugal. Yeah, showing that addicts recover quicker if given a roof over their head first. Yeah, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, for, that's from Marianne Wilson. And uh, more decades of work have shown that, uh, let's see here, the connection to trauma, uh, not teenage recreational use. Well, yeah, there's, there's a lot of research and things going on. We'll see. I mean, a, a, a troubled teen is going to be far more likely to experiment in some of the harder things like fentanyl and so on than, than others. But recreational use is a large part of it. Uh, it, 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 it it's, I mean, the thing is with some of these powerful things like uh, fentanyl and that, I mean, are, are, it doesn't take much to get yourself hooked. I mean, just a, a short experimentation time. Uh, the studies out of Portugal and that, if given the roof over their head, uh, you see, the, there's the, some of the chicken and egg problem we have with with uh, homeless people because yes they, they're not going to recover if they're out on the streets it's not going to help but at the same time a lot of them aren't in condition to be in a regular house yet they're, they're out of control they're in the throes of addiction they need a treatment center they need a secure facility to get treated and even then with treatment i believe the odds are about 40 percent will stay clean for the next two years after that but i mean the odds are darn near zero if they don't get treatment so expanding that treatment uh, but some people say, you know, we hear that from the progressives a lot. They just need more housing. They need more housing. Well, that's an element. That's more of post-treatment. You will need a house. You'll need a home. You won't be able to get into the working market and build a life without a home. But until they're treated, they're not in condition to get into a home. So we, we've got a big, complicated problem. And a, a part of it makes us squeamish. We're uncomfortable with it. We feel bad about it. We know it's complicated, so we deny it and we hide from it. And that's a lot of what happens, is, and that's what gets me ranting about our provincial and municipal politicians because they just they throw out other things that you know fluffy things and ideas and then just dodge the issue altogether because it's too complicated it's too difficult to cope with and they'd rather avoid it altogether and that's not going to solve it 
So, uh, yeah, that's why I keep going on about it because I get to see it every, every day when I come downtown and there's no single answer. I mean, addiction treatment's a lot like anything else with people or even with kids in school. If you think not everybody responds the same way to different means of recovery. Uh, it's a tough, tough area, but we're all going to do better with the more people we can break away from that horrible crap that they're consuming all the time. Okay, but enough on that. I am going to get on to Dr. Leslin Lewis. We're going to run that interview. She is, again, definitely one of the leading contenders for the Conservative Party of Canada leadership race coming up here. I spoke to her this morning. It was a fantastic discussion. And uh, I'll let you guys run through it. Talk through the uh, comments section while we're at it. And I'll see you in a little while. Thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Lewis. We've been... uh, Looking forward to it. Your uh, run for the leadership the last time around, while while you didn't win it, was was very impressive. You certainly made a mark, and and you're uh, an automatic contender coming into this one. So it's uh, going to be very interesting watching this race developing. Yes, it's it's, so, it's exciting to be here again. Yeah, well, you, you've got your work cut out. This is a a very long campaign going on until September. There's going to be a, a lot of issues to cover. Maybe I'll, I'll start on one, and we are a, a predominantly Western publication here at the Western Standard, and a, an area of big concern for us, of course, it, it often focuses around energy and some of the attitudes towards energy from Ottawa. Our Environment Minister uh, Stephen Gilbo has set and, and come out today, as well as Prime Minister Trudeau, with some, some very aggressive uh, emissions reduction targets that are, are probably going to pressure uh, the Alberta oil field very heavily. Uh, what kind of response do you have to that sort of planning and, and uh, projection, I guess? Well, I think it's very important that any policy that we implement takes into account the regional uniqueness of, of the West and just how reliant they, that economy is on uh, oil, natural gas, um, LNG production. And so I think that we have to take that into consideration and any any policies that are implemented should also look at what are how much of this product are we importing, and if we're not dealing with uh, the importation of that, then again, what we're doing is we're creating policies that's just going to stymie production in certain areas. It's going to create alienation, exacerbate the already existing alienation. Because if you look at the policy of uh, the um, regulation Bill C-48 and Bill C-69, we know that those regulations favored uh, foreign production and it really crippled our local industries. And so we we witnessed corporations fleeing Canada, going to other pay- places that had more enabling legislation. And that's really, really problematic. And so we have to make sure that our environmental policies are all encompassing and look at our natural gifts and our natural resources and and our natural endowments, such as the accessible oil reserves that we have. So uh, in getting further with infrastructure, because uh, I mean, there is quite a demand for oil at this time and and gas and and, uh, ethically produced Canadian products, but we're having a very hard time getting it to market. Our pipelines have been stopped in, in almost all directions, whether Keystone to the south or Northern Gateway uh, to the west or, or Energy East, of course, to the east. Uh, would uh, a government under you be examining more ways for uh, Canadian products to get to Tidewater? Absolutely. I think it's very essential. And I look at the environment from a holistic perspective. So I look at the entire life cycle of products. Uh, whether they be electric cars or solar panels or um, wind generation. I look at the entire life cycle from the day it's created to how do we dispose of it after we're done using it. And so when you do do that, you'll see that um, certain things are not as environmentally friendly as we actually think they are. And the building pipelines are the most, that is the most efficient way to transport um, LNG and, and our, our oil and gas. It's very, very important It's that we build these pipelines. It's more efficient than trucking and, and um, rail transportation. And I think it's very important that we get our product to Tidewater because we, are, we will be able to offset some of the uh, dependency on Russian oil that we see in Europe. And it will also 
bring revenues into our country and assist us with some of the issues that we're having with the high rates of unemployment unemployment that we're facing post-COVID. Great. And then getting into uh, more governance issues, I guess, and such, uh, an area of concern for us has is, is always been equalization. We, we held our referendum on that recently in Alberta. We, we do understand it's constitutionally entrenched. It's not easy to address, but the formula is in, within the, the ability of the federal government to set and determine. Uh, a lot of people in the West feel that perhaps the formula hasn't been fairly treating uh, outlying provinces. Would, would you be looking at reviewing the formula and how equalization has been applied? I think it's important that we look at some way of making the formula more equitable. And if you take, for example, what's happened in co with COVID, you'll see that the current formula, there's a three-year lag period. And because of this three-year lag period, in times of real hardship, just that, that we've experienced in COVID, the West have been paying, provinces like Alberta have been paying uh, equalization payments based on days of prosperity. And right now it's days of, of famine basically. And, and there, the formula has no mechanism of being altered to account for that current reality. So we have to, I think, even though it is constitutionally entrenched, I think Canadians are fair and that when they recognize that something is not uh, working in the best interest of, 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 say, a particular province and that it's unfair in, in certain respects, I think they will come to the table and find ways to, to um, modify the formula so that it's more equitable. Great. Um, your, uh, well, leadership competitor, uh, Pierre Polyev, the, the other day put out a release talking about uh, digital currencies and, and uh, facilitating the expansion of those within the Canadian market. Have, have you uh, determined a stance or, or looking at those sorts of things going forward as we have something of a new developing whole kind of industry and, and means of uh, commerce uh, on our hands right now? Well, um, Many people are concerned about digital identification and just the infrastructure that blockchain will bring in for facilitating that digital ID. So I think it's um, it's very early to, to say that that is something that you're going to implement without knowing whether or not this is something that the people want. I think it's, it's a little bit presumptuous and it's not something that um, is in our campaign. Uh, at this present time, uh, although we haven't put out fully our, our policies yet, we will be putting out our policies. But we're also very sensitive to the fact that people are very concerned about the digital ID and, and the um, repercussions of, of the blockchain on altering how we do things. Great. Um... Something I've been asking each candidate as I get them on, something we uh, of a tradition in Alberta since the late 80s has been we at least go through the motions of electing senators to nominate and propose towards Ottawa. And often if we have a, a favorable government, they will appoint the ones we've chosen. Uh, would you commit to appointing uh, senators if a province should elect them? Well, to be honest with you, I, I actually like the way that Alberta does this because it's not uh, patronage. It's the people. It's grassroots. And so the, sen the uh, senator-in-waiting in um, campaigns that took place last year, I found them very, very interesting because the candidates were out meeting with the people, engaging, um, seeing wh what the response was. And then the, the, the members were able to vote on who they wanted. And so in, in such a process, the, the person that is most connected to the community is the one that represents it and, and not someone that's handpicked by the government because of past favors or because of, of connections. Uh, so I think that the Alberta system is very, very good. Uh, I support it. And absolutely, if, if the people have said that this is who they want to represent them, I think that that should be honored by, by whichever prime minister is in place. Great. Um, economically, we, we've got uh, inflation, of course, has been a, a very strong issue all over the world now. A lot of it's been related to the pandemic, related to overseas conflicts. Uh, but I mean, a lot of it's been probably, you know, can be directly related to the amount of government spending and borrowing we've done. Is, is there a plan to 
rein in borrowing and, and, and spending and some of the, the, the output from the Bank of Canada? I think what's important is that we have to make sure that we bring our supply chains home and that we up our manufacturing production. And so we, we want to start being more of a production economy where we're producing things, we're generating wealth rather than uh, the government just uh, basically indebting future generations and creating a debt society. So we, we want to change that. The only way that you could really do that is to bring back confidence in the economy by in either incentivizing or promoting and encouraging small and medium-sized businesses who employ over 80% of the population to start reinvigorating, uh, re-employing people and taking chances again. And once we are able to uh, get the economy kick-started again, uh, up our production, then you will see a reduction in, in inflation because you'll have you'll have um, real dollars, real dollars, not just uh, debt, it, it, not just debt in our economy. And people will have real money that they can buy products rather than um, fewer products out there being chased by lots of uh, debt dollars. Great. Um, another thing that's put pressure on a lot of consumers when it comes to staples like foodstuffs is, is Canada's supply management system. Uh, it's a touchy issue. It always has been, but it's, it's one that certainly comes with a cost. Is there any consideration of possibly reforming or moving away from that system? Well, the, the problem is, is that our, our production, our products that we get from supply management I actually enjoy the fact that we have a superior production and output. And if you look at some of the, the, the things, the, the, the um, enhancements that are used by, say, in the United States, like BST on, on their cows and the, just the amount of pus that you would get in milk. And I, I just find that those products are not on the same level as our Canadian products. And so you have to pay for quality. And when you look at some of the industries worldwide and you ask our smaller producers to compete with them, they would be, they, they would be completely overshadowed. They, we would not have independent industries. And so while I am a free market person and I do believe in, in free market and I think it's... Um, I would, I would still think that we would need supply management to, uh, to assist our farmers or else they would be overtaken by uh, foreign production. Okay, uh, I'll pivot a little. I mean, something that's quite new on the scene for us, unfortunately, but it's in foreign affairs. You know, we, the world certainly has changed now with the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Uh, it seems to have ex expedited the Prime Minister to, in finally getting forward to uh, buying the, the F-35s for, for Canada that they've sort of shelved for quite some time. But wh where do you land on Canada's military spending and force, or, or where would you envision Canada's military being in the future? Well, uh, it's, it's been years since they, they, they should have bought those F-35 jets years ago. And it, I, I'm glad to see that they're making some commitment to do that now. Um, I think that our military has been underfunded and th this government has failed to provide for our military and to make sure that they were properly equipped. Um, I think that we had a lot of wasted time and there was a lot of vulnerabilities there. But when you see the recent acts of Russian aggression and you realize that we technically share a border with Russia, so our Arctic our Arctic coast um, is something that is very, very fragile. Uh, and and we, we have to make sure that we, we have the capacity, the military capacity to protect our borders. Um, even beyond that, even beyond the jets, I, I think that we, Russia has over 40 icebreakers um, and we have zero. We need to up our military capacity and invest in, in making sure that we can defend ourselves. Great. Well, I think we've already, it uh, goes fast, run out the, the time we'd allotted to sit down with you. I hope we get more chances before the end of the campaign, but is, is there more you'd like to add before we, we let you go, Dr. Lewis? Well, I will be in um, Alberta and 
Saskatchewan and Manitoba in the next week. I start my tour on Friday. So I look forward to um, perhaps popping in if you have a studio or um, meeting various people out there. So it's, it should be a very good tour. I look forward to meeting the uh, people in that region next week. Great. And well, we did expand actually into a nice larger new studio. So I hope we can get you in here for uh, an extended interview at that time. I, I look forward to you coming out and uh, wish you the, the best as the campaign develops. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Lewis. And, and I hope we can talk again soon. Awesome. It was great. Thank you so much. Take care. Great. So that was Dr. Leslin Lewis, one of the, uh, I would think leading contenders in, in the Conservative Party of Canada leadership race. As I said, this is going to be a really long one. They're going all the way till September 10th on this. I believe there's almost 10 people now have declared the entrance uh, requirements for that race with the party, though, are $300,000. $100,000 of it's a deposit, but you need another $200,000. I suspect that number is going to get a lot smaller by the time they close off nominations coming in. Not everybody's necessarily going to be able to raise that uh, amount of funding or, or want to invest that much in uh, pursuing the race. But for now, there are a lot of con contestants. And uh, as I said, uh, Dr. Lewis is our fourth one. And uh, I hope to talk to every one of them. Uh, tomorrow, actually, I'm going to have another one, Joseph Borgo. He's one of the only ones who's not a member of parliament, actually, who's making a run for it. And he's he's uh, from Saskatchewan, and he's coming from a different perspective on things very much has established himself uh, on the uh, opposing uh, vaccine mandates and things such as that, which we haven't uh, seen a lot of out of the leadership contenders. Though, again, whether Mr. Bogo uh, makes the bar and, and become, you know, gets that $200,000 and so on, time will tell. It's, it's very early in the race. I'm going to be talking with our uh, Ottawa Parliamentary Bureau Chief, Matthew Horwood, a little later in the show. And one of the pieces he put out was the polling numbers right now showing that uh, well, you see, these, you got to watch the phrasing with some of these polls. So it's saying Jean Charest, like most Canadians feel he can win the election. Now, that doesn't mean most members feel they would want to vote for Jean Charest in the leadership, or even that most members feel that he's the one who's going to win it necessarily. It just means most Canadians think he will be the one who could win if he was the leader of the Conservative Party. So we're getting a long way down a road of speculation with that. But, I mean, polls are always interesting. They give us a, a snapshot. Uh, somebody's saying uh, Roman Babber, yeah, he's, he's an Ontario one. I've reached out multiple times. I've never heard back from him. So if anybody wants Roman to come on the show, I'm trying. Uh, some of these campaigns, I think, are a little more developed than others. But it's going to be a, a long and, and well-competed one, which is good. I mean, I like to see competition whether it's in, in the private market or whether it's in these races and things like that. If you don't have a number of them with some different points of views coming forward, you're not going to get a better candidate out of it. I mean, it doesn't guarantee you're going to get a good candidate, but it increases the odds. You know, acclamations, coronations, they don't do us any favors whatsoever. Uh, some people have also said, you know, that I've uh, been uh, on some of these interviews a little soft on them. I'm asking very basic questions, mostly Western-focused, regional, because that's a, an area, of course, of, uh, for a lot of our, our viewers, though. I mean, it, it is national. We've got a lot of people across the country watching. Uh, I'm hoping to get them back. You know, that's the thing. We'll, st we'll settle in, give them the basic questions now. And as I said, that th this race is going on into the summer months and into fall. We'll get a lot of these candidates back to talk again. And then perhaps we'll have a little more developed campaigns to be able to take more specific discussion points rather than the, the broader uh, issues that I keep addressing with them. And I'm, I'm asking a lot of them the same questions too, because I want to pin the, each one down on the, where their stances are going to be on these things. A one I've been disappointed with, with every one of them so far, not a single one is willing to take on supply management, not a one. We haven't had uh, a, a senior federal Canadian politician really try to take on supply management since Maxime Bernier, when he lost to uh, Scheer in the leadership race by 1%. And a lot of people agree, if they watch that race closely, Canada's dairy lobby is very effective. They're very strong, and they get straight to these candidates. There, there's no getting around that. And uh, Scheer sold his soul to the, uh, to the dairy lobby, and Bernier didn't. And that was enough to get that 1% to win. Uh, None of these candidates for so far have had the, the courage to go up against that dairy lobby. They're scared to death of them. And it's mostly Quebec based. And it's unfortunate, you know, because supply management, if you look it up, is an odious Soviet style policy. And it, it was interesting listening to uh, uh, Dr. Lewis when she spoke and she talked about the lack of quality 
in American dairy products versus Canadian. Those are talking points right out of the Dairy Commission's website. And it's not true, guys. It's not true. So look into some of these things. But it, it, welcome to the nature of politics. That's why we got to keep asking about these things. And I'll, I'll keep uh, hoping somebody can actually take down that odious system. Uh, to give the analogy, and a lot of people aren't necessarily familiar with supply management. I've used it over and over, but I'll use it one more time. My wife, Jane, grew up in a small dairy farm in Alberta. Uh, they just had a small number of cows. They had a quota where they were allowed to sell some degree of cream, not allowed to sell milk. You milk the cows, you skim the cream, you pour the spare milk down the ditch if you can't feed it to your family or pigs or something because you're not allowed to sell. It is illegal to sell that milk. That's why, and I know some people get upset when I use it, Soviet style because that's exactly what it is. You made it illegal for a person to sell their product. That's how stupid and ridiculous and regressive and communist supply management is. And none of our politicians so far to date have the courage to go up against it. And it's very disappointing. So uh, let's talk about a sponsor, though. Speaking of, um, I didn't get to ask Leslin about that. Darn it. Firearms. Canada Shooting Sports Association. They've been a great sponsor for us for some time now. And uh, the, their name sort of says what they are. They're a, an association for people who enjoy shooting sports, whether it's target shooting, hunting, collecting, whatever. It's your business. You're legal Law-abiding citizen, you have the right to have firearms. It's not entrenched like it is in the United States, unfortunately, which means our government is coming after your right to, to enjoy those pieces of property all the time. And we have to keep fighting back, pushing back, or they will take these away. They do not, it, this is not a government that likes freedom. They don't like free speech. They don't like free association. And I can assure you, they don't like you having the ability to have a firearm. So they're constantly recategorizing them and suddenly turning law-abiding fire, firearm owners into criminals. It's, it's, it's a terrible trend. It's bad for all of us. And they're going to get away with it if we don't push back. So these guys give you the resources. They've got a number of legal challenges out on your behalf, and they're, they're, they're pushing back against the Liberal government. Because if we don't, they win. Check them out. Join them. Take out a membership. They need your help. Canada Shooting Sports Association. And it's not just for the legal pushbacks. They've got other resources. Uh, videos on safe utilization of firearms, whether for target shooting and things like that. They got links to uh, trade shows that are going on and they keep you up to date on lots of other firearms issues. It's an association, just like the name sounds like Canada, Canadian Fire Shooting Sports Association. I always have a trouble with that one. Their URL is CSSA-CILA.org. Got to stand up for your rights or you're going to lose them guys. So uh, before we get to our next guest, let's have a look at a few more things. Things here, as somebody mentioned earlier, Dave did, yes, with the uh, Jody Gondek, uh, you know, and her approval ratings in Calgary. So people, I know you're across the, the country. We've had a new mayor come in. It was Jody Gondek. She hit the ground really running uh, as a new mayor last uh, October, declaring a climate emergency and torpedoing the Calgary uh, arena deal and, and uh, virtue signaling so hard it was almost painful to, to watch her perform. And now the numbers are in, and uh, she's got an approval rating in a poll of 38%. Like, for most politicians, particularly municipally, once they're in, as long as you're being reasonable, you're going to get a good honeymoon period. The, the, the public will be easy on you to a degree. They're going to wait and see what you're up to. And, uh, you know, some of these numbers uh, are, are, are unreal. Like, Dave Bronconier years ago, he had 75% approval at this point. Nenshi. Yeah, my buddy Nenshi. At this point in his mayorship, he had 86% approval. And Mayor Gondek right now is uh, mired at 38% saying they approve of it. And that's only five months in office. She has better recalibrate her direction and figure out what she's going to do. In Calgary, it's incre incredibly rare for uh, an incumbent mayor to be unseated in an election. Very, I think Klein was the last one to do it back in the 80s. But it's not impossible. And Gondek might be the next one to do it. I mean, that's a terrible start. I, I, I do think she fixed one of the problems she had, though. And for people, uh, if you're not familiar, then there's a gentleman named Stephen Carter. He's a political, I don't know what you'd call him, strategist sort. He's, he, he, just Google his name, Stephen Carter, and, and you'll see a long history of political disasters whenever he gets involved. He seems to have quite a talent for getting on with candidates and getting them elected. That part he does all right with. He, he latched on an inchy and got an inchy elected. He latched on to Allison Redford and she became premier. But shortly after these roles, he usually gets on as chief of staff. And usually within a few months, he seems to get fired because he is an odious little man. And uh, 
It's amazing, you know, Gondek's performance actually seems to have improved a great deal since they fired uh, Carter a, a month or so ago. Uh, so, I mean, I, you know, still the, the responsibility lands on the mayor's lap for her behavior and uh, her governance. But I think uh, she has taken care of one of the larger problems she had to begin with. Uh, if you want to find out again how uh, effective Mr. Carter is, ask the people with the Alberta party, which was climbing up and doing quite well and had a popular leader with an elected seat. And uh, under Carter's guidance, they torpedoed their own leader, threw him under the bus, brought in uh, a, a new leader from Edmonton, went into the provincial election and got completely annihilated. Their bank accounts, of course, have since been drained because uh, they don't get donors anymore. And this party that showed some promise is now in the toilet and Carter is nowhere to be seen. He took off and, and joined up with Gondex since then. And you know what? He's going to surface with somebody else. I bet you he's attached to one of these conservative leadership campaigns because he just never seems to disappear. But uh, I like calling him out and make sure we can document his uh, record in the political realm because perhaps the more people get to know just who Mr. Carter is, the fewer who will have to deal with him in the future. I was on the, the Wild Rose Party uh, Executive Committee back when uh, Stephen Carter came and went twice in the employ of the party, both times. The first time he left a disgrace over a bunch of bills he'd left. There was a, a beautiful Calgary Sun cover, actually. It's a chief of stiff and had a picture of him because uh, his, his organization had left a lot of uh, debt and hanging. And uh, he left the Wild Rose at that point. Then he came back for a short period of time and uh, he quit on his own after his short visit to suddenly join up with Allison Redford. Uh, of course, in that short period of time, while he was with the Wild Rose Party, he sure had a lot of access to Wild Rose Party inside records and information. I'm certain, though, Mr. Carter didn't take any of that on his way out. Political play. It's no wonder people get apathetic and give up on it sometimes when we see some of the stuff going on. But all we can do is keep reporting on it, encouraging people to fire the ones when they're doing a bad job because we don't get out to vote enough, and just keep exposing them when they're doing so. And sometimes they do a good job. I mean, if we push them the right way, they can occasionally make the right decision. Honest, it happens. It's rare, but it happens. So I'm, I'm going to bring in a guest who's been lobbying uh, with the Montreal Economic Institute, uh, which is a great organization. They're, don't let the name fool you. Actually, they're national. Uh, she's uh, Calgary-based, and they talk to a lot of energy issues and things like that. And they're one of the groups that is um, pushing for responsible government on a number of fronts. And, and they, they put a column out under uh, Mr. Roulette the other day, which was very good, on something, to be honest, I hadn't been paying close attention to either. And uh, it's the Bay de Nord... Uh, oil project, I might be mispronouncing that, I am Albertan, and uh, it's it's pending and it may or may not be approved soon and uh, it's at risk and this is a huge project that would be good for all of Canada, including in particular Newfoundland. So let's bring uh, Crystal in to talk a little further about that. Hey, how you doing? Hi, I'm great. How are you? Very good. Thanks uh, for coming in. I see uh, we got you there. Your name, I, I, I always stumble over Crystal Whitvrongel, uh, or is it Witta? I know, and you've been on before. It's great to have you back on. I'm just such a brutal person with names. It's because I had a simple one, and I never had to explain my own to anybody. So this project uh, out in Newfoundland, it's coming up for uh, federal approval or, or being declined in the very near future, is it? Yeah, so this project, the Bay to Nord project, it is about 500 kilometers east of Newfoundland and Labrador. And it is set to be Canada's first deep water oil and gas development, if all goes well. So the project itself is looking at being a 30 year project and it can unearth and extract between 300 million and a billion barrels of oil. And first oil can be expected about 2028. And so it has now been delayed twice for federal approval pardon me, for federal approval by the Federal Minister of Environment and Climate Change. And we're looking at getting, a, hopefully, a final decision by April 15th now on moving forward with the project. Yeah, and April 15th, that's not very long from now at all. But unfortunately, when we listen to our Prime Minister and uh, his, his right-hand man, uh, Stephen Gilbol there, they, they came out today talking about some very, very aggressive emissions targets to be met by at least the existing uh, energy producers it doesn't make it sound very promising that they're going to turn around and approve a major uh, conventional oil develop well offshore oil development uh, in Canada in the near future. I mean, well, we've got to also consider that the environmental assessment report was carried out back in August of 2021, 
by the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada. And so at the time, they said that there is it's not likely to cause significant adverse environmental effects. So we already have that ruling. We know this going in. However, the issue is that this is an ecologically sensitive area, but it is argued that the economic benefits to be had from this project greatly outweigh the risk because we're looking at the creation of thousands of jobs as well as um, adding 3.5 billion to government revenue. So we're talking about Newfoundland and Labrador here. We are talking about a province who is suffering the worst unemployment rate in Canada, who is uh, facing staggering debt and constantly sort of, you know, hovering near bankruptcy. This has huge potential for that province. They recently saw their um, revenues in the 2020 to 2021 fiscal year, their oil revenues fell by 40% because of the government restrictions and COVID and all that stuff. So there is a lot to be gained by this province currently, um, as well as in the future. So, you know, thinking about this report that says it's unlikely to cause significant adverse effects, we need to consider the significant benefits that could be accrued to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador right now, currently. Well, yeah, and that's something that's lacking in a lot of politics. I think, you know, in the broader spectrum of things is, is cost benefit. I mean, there's no such thing as a zero risk uh, energy project of any kind or zero impact. We can only work to mitigate it as much as humanly possible. And, and then we determine whether it's a worthwhile risk to take or not. And unfortunately, with the images of, of the incident down in the, the Gulf of Mexico some years ago, people worry a lot about that. But I mean, realistically, there are thousands and thousands of offshore energy projects that, that are operating perfectly safely and, uh, and profitably. Well, exactly. And we know that we're expecting to increase our oil demand by 2045 of about 9 or 10 percent. So this oil is going to come from somewhere let it be somewhere with stringent and you know pretty restrictive and and a lot of oversight on our environmental regulatory frameworks and so on let this come from somewhere like us rather than somewhere that doesn't have these frameworks like Saudi Arabia you know we have to think about you know that cost benefit analysis like you were mentioning of these global emissions targets that we're looking at as well as you know what's how do we get there together in the sense of you know, we all got to give and take. And this is where Canada can be. It's continued to be a leader. And, you know, it just it, it's it's a project that has so much benefit. Um, and there isn't enough discussion on the safety and the you know regulatory mechanisms that are in place to manage these issues as they arise. Well, that's an important point you brought up was, I mean, projected demand for world petrochemical products. I mean, there, there's uh, an area of delusion, unfortunately, among a lot of people who just seem to, they set these targets and they feel that the world is just going to move beyond using hydrocarbons and they start acting and, and enacting policies under the assumption that that's going to happen. But no economist or energy expert worth their salt is saying that we're going to get off of petrochemical usage anytime soon. We're going to need it for some years to come. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, we can look at the current situation where, um, you know, energy security in Europe, and they've been struggling over the past couple of months, especially the past couple of weeks, as we know, you know, the, the uh, situation with Russia and Ukraine, and, and everything like that. And so we need to think about how we can be displacing some of these more um, less friendly oil sources, or in this case, Russian oil. Um, Canadian producers are currently looking to hike their production of oil and gas by about 300,000 barrels per day by the end of the year to start and continue to displace Russian Russian oil products. Uh, but this unfortunately is only a small percentage of the Russian oil imports to Europe. But I mean, it's a start. So if, we, if we're thinking long term, there's places that also are developing their oil reserves and their oil products that are not doing it as safely, as I mentioned, as us. Um, and so it just, it seems like we're, we're constantly stuck in the same conversation of the negatives that could come from developing it here when we need to really also bring in that there's so much benefit, not only economically, but you know, to our, our greater ecosystem um, by displacing some of these other countries and their sources. 
Yeah, and this project looks really interesting. Like, I, I spent 20 years in the field and exploration, but it was always land-based. Uh, well, except when I was on the Beaufort. It was frozen underneath us, so I still couldn't quite compare it with, uh, with offshore stuff. Um, but this, so this would be a ship that, that is going to bring on oil and even process to a degree. And I, how does this work? Uh, do tankers, I guess, would nurse off of that site and then they could deliver the product elsewhere? I mean, if that's the case, it's, it's quite ideal for export as well, if not bringing in more uh, domestic supply. Yeah, um, my understanding is pretty much what you kind of just laid out there. I'm not super um, in tune with all the technical details that's above my head <laughs> when it comes to those sorts of things at this stage. Um, but I'm more focused on the policy relevant aspects of this and sort of the greater benefit to Newfoundland and Labrador um, and, and greater exports, as you mentioned as well, not just, you know, the province, but to more, you know, the federal sphere um, of the entire country. Well, and environmentally, I mean, something we seem to be yelling into the wind quite often, but there are a number of tankers always moving back and forth up the St. Lawrence River, delivering oil to eastern Canada. Well, if we're going to do that anyways, let's run it from Newfoundland over rather than all the way from Saudi Arabia or Venezuela uh, from more distant ports. I, I'd imagine even though the risk is low in shipping oil by tanker, the more you're out there in the middle of the open ocean, the higher your risk. So if we're bringing that domestic supply from nearby, it can only be safer for, for things in general. Yeah, I mean, I would I would agree with that assessment. And I would think that, you know, if we're going to talk about risks, like we kind of have been chatting about throughout our talk here, we need to consider those risks as well, not just the risks that fit a certain narrative, the risks overall of all of the little moving pieces and the bits of, of things that maybe don't jive with, like I said, a certain narrative around the whole thing. So... Is that, I, I really, as I said before, I, I looked at some maps. It looks like that's part of a larger field though, right? Would there potentially be more development surrounding that if this project was a success? Uh, I'm not entirely sure on that at this time. Um, I haven't heard of any, you know, slated for um, approval or anything like that. I mean, this project itself has been sort of in the, the works for a number of years now, trying to even just get the approval. Uh, so... It's hard to say whether or not others might arise, um, but nothing that has you know crossed my radar at this moment. That's not to say it it doesn't exist. Yeah, well, and if there was any time, I think that would be most ideal. At least, as I said, we have a federal government that's pretty ideologically opposed to petrochemical development. Uh, but right now, I mean, the world has gotten a very hard reality check on how dependent they really are on conventional energy sources still, whether they want to be or not, due to the, the Russian Ukraine conflict. Uh, between that and, and our economy and a number of things, this might be the, the time that the government will just say, well, look, we don't like these things, but we've just got to approve it because we need it and there's no getting around it. Well, exactly. Um, and, and I fully and completely agree with your sentiment there. And when we're talking about, you know, a smaller economy like Newfoundland and Labrador, the oil and gas industry there accounts for 25% of the province's GDP and 41% of its exports over the past 20 years. So it's it's not small in the amount of space it takes up for an economy like that. And like I mentioned, you know, they have crushing unemployment, uh, crushing debt, all of these issues that something like this project could really help smooth some of those pieces. It doesn't need to be that, you know, a project like this happens in isolation in the sense of, you know, it's not all or nothing. It's not, oh, we're, we're going to abandon any other, you know, renewable energy alternatives or anything like that. But we need to see with what, what's the best things we can be working with at the present time and what makes the most sense in, in a balanced way of, of going about it. Well, yeah, and in, in chasing that, uh, what's become a holy grail in Alberta of economic diversification, uh, one of the things that does help is having a favorable local business climate and an affordable one. And a lot of people actually don't realize, but Alberta's economy is very diverse. We have a, a lot of industries. Uh, the, the oil and gas sector, of course, is a great advantage, but we, we've blossomed into all sorts of things. And it wasn't so much from direct subsidies or government treatment. It was just because thanks to the oil and gas, we've been able to maintain a, a low cost of operation and taxes. So it, it's encouraged new businesses to come out. And Newfoundland could have that opportunity if they did it wisely. That's a big if, I know, with governments. But still, I mean, if they get all those royalty revenues from a good developed uh, energy field, that's where you could bring in new innovative companies, whether even uh, alternative energy generation. 
Exactly. And I mean, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador is in favor of this project. So it's not that, you know, industry is pushing it and it's meeting some sort of opposition. It, it, that's not the case here. It's that this federal decision continues to be delayed, you know, needing more time to decipher the information or, or you know, look over these impact assessment results or, or whatever it might be. But those were have been in place and been released since August of 2021. So, you know, buying more time for whatever reason, it, it doesn't seem to be making sense anymore, uh, especially when we're seeing the situation in, with Russian oil. Um, if anything, that makes this so much more, you know, a powerful reason for this project to move forward, in my opinion. Well, it's in, and dragging it out comes at a cost, a big cost, and it harms the whole country. A lot of people don't realize that. I mean, when they step on a, a project in Western Canada or if they're delaying on this, it's sending a message to investors for pretty much anything that we're not a safe place to invest in. We can't get our projects done in a, in a timely manner. We can't get an approval or an answer. I mean, it's almost, and I'll only say almost, almost worse when they'll sit there not giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down, then a thumbs down, because at least then the investors can move on to something else. But when they keep it dragging out like this, it just shoots the cost through the roof and makes us all look terrible as a place to invest. Exactly. Like I, I look at it kind of in comparison to pharmaceutical industry, for example. You know, we in Canada have such lengthy reviews on the regulatory side of things, not safety in terms of, you know, clinical trials and that sort of thing. I'm talking just strictly the regulatory approval of, you know, applications and so on. Our regulatory approval is so much slower than other countries. And as a result, we get less innovative medicines that are introduced here first. Uh, we have less variety in the medicines and the medical devices that are introduced as a result of this. So, you know, just speaking kind of broadly, this is sort of something that touches a, a number of sectors in that, you know, uh, it's kind of starting to not look good in a certain number of areas if we continue to, you know, just drag these regulatory processes on, you know, while also still respecting the robust and rigid nature of them at the same time. Yeah, well, and people who haven't been in business for themselves don't necessarily understand just how expensive and odious bureaucracy and red tape is for your operations. I mean, even as a, a pub owner on the small scale where I was in the past, the amount of hoops I had to jump through to be a licensed operation. And I mean, I understand there's going to be a degree of regulation that's realistic, but I, I'm dedicating a large percentage, not a huge, but a good percentage of, of my time and work and funds into just being in compliance with regulation. And then that's just a micro scale of it, but it's very real and it has a very real impact. And then we've really got to work on shaving that, particularly when it comes to these mega projects. Exactly, yeah. And the, the regulatory burden and this red tape that kind of mires everything in its wake is really holding things down and is really, you know, pulling down on these mega projects that have so much, sorry, I said mega projects, but I mean just projects in general um, that have so much potential. And, you know, originally first oil could have been expected in 2025 with this Beta Nord project. Now we're looking at, you know, 2028 because of these delays. So, you know, it, it might seem like it's a far ways away, but that's actually just around the corner. But not if we keep pushing it off because we're delaying things and constantly needing to go back over through the same things or, you know, need more time to make a decision about something. Yeah, so we're, we're hitting a critical point. As you said, Newfoundland's in support of this. Uh, clearly, the Montreal Economic Institute's in support of it. Uh, but is there any, are there any initiatives going that people could go to petitions or, or things such as that to try and uh, encourage government to, to act the right way when the decision day comes in a few weeks here? I have seen, um, I think they're Canada Strong and Free, I believe, is in support of it. Um, I'm not sure if they have any sort of petitions or um, kind of uh, setups going, um, but I have seen them them talking about it. And I know they do those sorts of things with other initiatives that are, are important to the country as a whole. Uh, so I would suggest to check that out. But also, um, even just through our own website, you know, you can link through and see, you know, articles on other energy topics that might link with support for this one as well. Great. Yeah, I just like to remind people, you know, it feels futile. It feels like you're, you're yelling into the wind. But, you know, these, these members of parliament do get those emails, or at least their assistants do. And 
if there's enough groundswell, they do actually move in a direction. I mean, they want to get reelected. If they think this is the way the public's looking, they, they will act that way. So I guess, you know, the time to reach out is now, Neg, uh, particularly your, your Liberal member, if you have one, and, and uh, perhaps they'll make the right choice on this. So I appreciate you guys bringing it up, because as I said, I, I, didn't, I wasn't even very well aware of it, even though I'm somewhat energy in tune. I'm on the wrong side of the country. And it's important that we all know about these things going on. So where can we find more information about the, this project and the Montreal Economic Institute and all the stuff you guys are doing? So our website is www.iedm.org. Um, and that can you know, link through to a number of different topics and, and energy is a large one for us. Um, and I would just sort of recommend watching the federal stage for this April 15th deadline of, you know, is it going to in fact be pushed again? Are we going to have some sort of news on this project uh, and that sort of thing? So we will definitely be watching that closely and, you know, putting out something uh, on the 15th to either say, yay, we have a decision uh, or here we are again, waiting again. So um, we'll, we'll have something coming out around then as well. Great. Well, let's hope it's uh, a yay, they did something right, and then you can move on to getting on their case about something else they're doing wrong. I mean, there's always lots to work on, so uh, we'll applaud them when they make the right steps when they do. So, well, thank you very much for joining me again today, Crystal. It's always good talking to you, and the viewers appreciate a, a common sense view coming through to them now and then. Uh, let's thank you so much. Go. All right, we'll talk again. So that was uh, Crystal Whitvrongel with the Montreal Economic Institute and the Bay de Nord Project. And again, it's worth reminding your politicians it's it's if we don't speak up we'll lose for sure we we have to stay active on these things i mean this is a great project it's huge it's safe and it's local and uh, we unfortunately have you know as i've said an ideologically driven prime minister with it with uh, surrounded himself with fools and in our environment minister and i could see them very much uh, being inclined to shut this down as, as foolish as it is so Let's make sure people are aware of it anyways. And even if they do shut down, then let's make people aware of what this government just did, what they just shut down, how they're harming this country. Coast to coast. It's not even a Western thing. I think they got a better chance of getting that approved than some of the Western things we have going on because it is, you know, where they've got a better chance of winning seats as liberals. But all the same, I mean, Trudeau wants to make his, his green legacy. He wants to make his mark. He wants to save the world and, uh, you know, reality isn't a, a large part of his vision, unfortunately, especially when it comes to energy or economics. Remember, he is the man who thinks budgets balance themselves. Uh, getting on farther about a carbon tax talk, I just noticed a comment or gorgeous George uh, saying, uh, I'd like to see reporters ask the leaders what the success of the carbon tax has been. I did pitch that a, a little bit to Sheree, I believe. I'm trying to remember. It was one of those leaders I, I was interviewing because uh, I, I knew he was supportive of a carbon tax. But at least I framed it in pointing out, you know, BC has had a carbon tax for a long time and it doesn't work. It just doesn't. It's, it's not a matter of theory. If carbon taxes worked, BC's emissions would have gone down by now. As simple as that. It didn't. Their emissions have not gone down. Their wallets have gotten emptier. It's been effective that way. But when it comes to actually reducing emissions, if that's what it is, if it's the be all and end all is to reduce carbon emissions, if that's really how we're going to save the world and keep all the fluffy bunnies happy and all that good stuff, Carbon taxes aren't the way to do it. I, I, I think some of it is. Uh, it's underhanded and the carbon tax proponents won't admit it. But if we can just castrate the economy hard enough, people will stay home, not spend money, go a little more stone age, put on another sweater, get a smaller house, stop taking vacations, stop driving to work, and then they will theoretically emit less. But what... You know, centuries of the industrial revolution, I mean, increasing our lifespans, increasing our comfort, increasing our ability to get out and travel and do these things, bringing travel into the unwashed, they want us to go back away from all that. There's some of the hypocrisy from these people all the time. They love traveling. I like traveling. But, you know, if you read back, you read those old stories from the Victorian times and things like that, I read like reading that, and you'd hear about those, the rich and the elite, how they would take trips, you know, oh, they'll take a sabbatical and spend six months going around the world. It was only the realm of the ultra-rich to be able to travel and experience other cultures and, and uh, you know, just for pleasure and, and doing things like that. And now it is possible for us, you know, a person just to work, save, a middle-class person can get out and see the world and do things. Well, these people want to take away that right. These are the ones, though, that send thousands of people to environmental summits. These are the ones that stay in the luxury hotels over there while they're at it. They want to make sure they can do it. You know, Trudeau likes illegally vacationing at a, a Bahamas island of a buddy. He was sanctioned for that. 
And when he's not doing that, he's, he's flying on uh, government subsidized uh, airlines to go around the world and embarrass himself uh, at uh, European parliamentary functions. And all of these people, there's a giant subgroup of these people. You want to see a lot of where your money gets pissed away by these guys? Look at the groups that go to these international summits. Look at the groups that go to these conventions. Look at the accommodations they stay in. And I assure you, they don't fly squished into coach like you and I do when they go to these places. They're flying first class. They're eating well. They're not staying at the Super 8. Hey, I don't expect them to stay in a tent. We are in the world where they're telling all of us to stay home and do Zoom meetings in case we might get the flu. But they still want to bounce around all over the world on these international uh, uh, junkets on our dime. And uh, yet, they claim they're saving the world through the environment. Yeah, right. Uh, it's pretty brutal. Let's see what else we got going on in the comments. Good to see you there again, Brad. Yeah, I know you came on a little late the other day. And uh, uh, June saying, I wish Corey would have some of our political prisoners on, uh, on, but they're not allowed to talk to the press. And that's absolutely true. Um, I, I had been in touch with uh, Tamara Leach in the past. Of course, she's not allowed to talk uh, publicly on things. Once she's finished with all of her legal nightmares and things going on, I'm certain we will get the chance to talk to her down the road. But right now, they are locked up and under some very, uh, or, or out on bail at least, but some very restrictive conditions. And I don't blame them for not coming out and talking. They've put in enough. You don't need them tossed back in jail because they, they came out and spoke with us on some things. So before I get to Matthew, I'm going to talk... Uh, quickly about our sponsor one more time and that is bitcoin well these guys have been a great sponsor they were the western standards first big sponsor actually uh when we uh, got rolling when things were getting going i mean we're only two and some years old but we've been expanding uh, in a fantastic way and bitcoin well has been a part of that and i think part of it's because it targets people who are unwoke it's a woke in a different way these are people that realize that you want to get your hard-earned money away from the central banks, away from the government. You want to hedge your bets. You're working hard for that. You want to save it. The currency has been devaluing. Inflation is going up. Digital currencies are the way to go, or at least for some people. Bitcoin Well facilitates you getting into it. They're a Western Canadian company. They'll give you a one-on-one -on -one service because, I mean, it's the mistrust. That's what people worry about. Of course, you've worked for that money. You can sit down face-to-face -face with a person. It's not some call center over across the ocean it's not even across the country. You can meet face to face. They call it white glove service. They'll set you up with your digital account and how you can use it. And I've been mentioning before, they got commercial accounts. So you own a company, you got your employees set up. We're doing that here at the Western Standard. Every month, a portion of my check goes into my Bitcoin wallet and the Western Standard matches that. It's a nice little savings plan. It's not huge and it's voluntary, of course, for employees, but I like it. I think it's great. Bitcoin, well, these guys can set your company up with that sort of thing or Talk to your boss, see if uh, they want to get involved. And then that's how you can just set a little side uh, off um, to the, for yourself. As somebody asking, has the Western Standard ever interviewed either of the two Michaels? No, I don't believe they have, actually. I'm not even sure how I'd reach them, but it would be a fascinating interview. Uh, thanks, Daryl. Let me have a look into that and see if it's uh, possible. Uh, Cheryl, how can the RCP justify the arrests of Hillier and no arrests for the coastal link attack? Well, because I think they haven't found the attackers there yet. I, I hope that's the case. Uh, yeah, I do hope they catch those eco-terrorists soon because it's very disturbing what they did and that they're still uh, out there and about and potentially could be doing more dangerous acts. Okay, let's bring the Western Standard Parliamentary, I believe the title is Bureau Chief now. Boy, we're staffing so fast I can't keep up. Matthew Horwood, he's been on before and boy, he's been writing like crazy, increasing our federal presence with these stories and talk about some of the stuff he's been covering this week. So uh, we'll be there in a moment. There you are. Hey, Matthew, how's it going? Pretty good, Corey. Good to be with you. Right on. Thanks for coming back in. I appreciate that. Uh, as I said, I, you know, before I bring somebody on, I like to look and see what they've written recently. And holy cow, you're just you're just putting out great stories left, right, and center. So it's hard to to tell where to begin here. But I mean, part of the, I'll start with some of the older stuff. Uh, there were more protests in Ottawa again last weekend. There were. It was quite a big we uh, weekend for the uh, uh, another freedom convoy that rolled through the town. Um, a bit of a much smaller one than the original. There were about 100 people that gathered on Parliament Hill around noon to listen to uh, guest speakers. Uh, they had uh, Bethan Nodwell. She's an organizer for Freedom Fighters Canada. She spoke a little bit about um, what was going on. She said that uh, they have plans to protest all summer long, which would be quite interesting. Uh, there was also Daniel Bulford. Uh, you might remember him as a former RCMP officer who worked very closely with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Uh, he talked about the uh, intimidation charges that were laid against the uh, organizers of the original Freedom Convoy. 
um, he made the point that the uh, biggest offenders of intimidation in Canada are actually the premiers and the prime minister. And he said that they all need to go to jail. Very uh, inflammatory language. Um, and then around uh, four o'clock, the uh, convoy rolled through Ottawa. Uh, it came from Quebec City. It was on its way to uh, Van Cleek Hill. Uh, it's a small town outside Ottawa. And um, yeah, they, uh, they didn't stop. They rolled on through. Uh, they weren't allowed to honk, but uh, there still was uh, a little bit of noise being made. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was quite the scene. Uh, hard, hard to miss, hard to uh, um, not hear during the afternoon. So, so they weren't uh, in violation then of any current injunctions or anything with what they did, or at least not to the point that the local authorities wanted to uh, intervene. They just let them pass through. No, not at all. The Ottawa police said they considered uh, towing them, getting more police forces on the ground, but they wanted to uh, let them roll through in, um, uh, in in agreement with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, and they said afterwards there were no issues. They moved on through. Ottawa police actually said they had problems with counter protesters who were blocking the flow of traffic and and uh, causing problems in that way, interestingly enough. But uh, no, no incidents of hate, no Nazi flags, none of the stuff that uh, um, we possibly saw at the last Freedom Convoy protest. Yeah, it sounds familiar. In Calgary, we've had our weekly protests going on for some time, and it really wasn't a problem until a handful of counter protesters came out and a march that used to take 15 minutes uh, to go down the street in front of businesses suddenly got turned into an hour because they were being blocked. Uh, but, I mean, the counter protesters have the right to get out there, too. We we're in some, some weird times. Uh, Absolutely. Freedom of speech on both, both ends. Yeah, I would think eventually these are, well, it depends. It depends on the restrictions, I, you know, but as they drop, I, I would think some degree of interest in protesting is going to drop and, and uh, these protests will fade away by the wayside eventually. But Yeah, well, that's definitely what we've seen. A lot less people were out there, but they're, you know, and people online question, well, why are they still protesting? You know, the provincial mandates are gone. It seems like they're going back to normal. But for a lot of these people, you know, they've still, they lost so much. Like I spoke to one guy, he said he lost his house and his job. So just because the mandates are gone, there's nothing to go back to for him. So why not stay in Ottawa and protest? And, you know, you got talk of a, a potential spring wave. You know, they're looking in the wastewater of Ottawa and they're finding more uh, incidents of or uh, traces of COVID. So, the, you know, if that were to come back, then you definitely see the interest ratchet up for these protests. And there was actually one guy, he was a former Canadian Forces veteran, and he said that there's going to be a motorcycle convoy to come into Ottawa uh, on uh, in the end of this month, actually, in the end of April. So that would be really interesting to see how large that ends up becoming. Yeah, well, that, that pub I used to own down in Prittis, we used to get an annual ride uh, with a bunch of bikers for a fundraiser, and there'd be hundreds of them. And boy, when you get that many Harleys in one spot, they'll really rattle the windows for a little tong, t uh, little while. That, uh, some people might miss the honking once those guys are finished coming through. Oh, yeah. We'll see which one would be worse. Yeah. Yeah. So getting further, I guess, in some of your other stories, uh, so there was some discussion with the federal fuel standard. They actually realized it might uh, raise the price of gas. I, I, I guess it's for most of us, that's like saying we knew the sun was warm, but in Ottawa, they do need to study these and discover these things, right? Yeah, for sure. Well, that was originally a Blacklock's reporter story, but uh, it, it is still, as you said, not a big surprise that that would raise the, raise the costs. Uh, yeah, it's really too bad probably not going to make much of a difference on the global scale. You know, China, their emissions are more than every developed nation combined. So what is literal old Canada? If, if we try to do all these things, is that going to make much of a difference in stopping climate change, saving the planet? I would, uh, I would think so, but I'm not an, I'm not an expert, just a reporter. So yeah, we'll no, see. I, I understand. And there's been more discussions. Another of your stories was talk about that with the bank of Canada and they're finding the lockdowns were a drag on the economy. Again, I, I don't think it really should have taken a scientist to realize that. But, uh, you know, these are things we need to discuss right now because they are, as you said, I mean, we're starting to see the levels that they're claiming that we might see another wave of COVID coming and the, 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 the frightened people are ready to dive right back into lockdowns again. And, and this comes at a big cost. Yeah, once again, who would have guessed that that would uh, come cause of the economy? Um, we'll have to see. I mean, I think a lot of people are just fed up with it. We've seen a, a serious return in normalcy at, here in Ottawa even which is a very, uh, people are very, seem to be more scared of COVID than in other smaller towns I've been to. But uh, so, yeah, we'll see if people have an appetite for going back uh, into lockdown. I don't think the fear that was initially there at the beginning of the pandemic is even close to as uh, palpable, but we'll have to see. Yeah, well, I, I think that's something I, I hope that the, the powers that be do realize that as the protests fade, though, people are still upset and they are not 
going to put up with further lockdowns. They, I, I got a feeling that new protests would dwarf what anything we saw before if they really actually tried to shut us all in as they had in the past. So whatever happens with COVID, I mean, at least in my view, that they're going to have to find a different way to cope with it because the last methods are not going to be accepted. Absolutely. I would agree with you on that. But, you know, they could come up with a new boogeyman. They could have climate lockdowns, something to do with Russia. I'm just spitballing here, right? But oh, no, and I wish it wasn't realistic, but it wouldn't surprise me any. Uh, so, so getting on to uh, the, the political scene, your, your more recent one with the poll on the conservatives. Uh, they, you know, we've got our leadership candidates. I had uh, Leslie Lewis on earlier and I had spoken to Jean Charest. Uh, most conservatives feel that he might be the man to win the next election. Yeah, it appears so. Uh, um, Jean Charest, it's it's interesting. You know, obviously he's more of a more left leaning uh, in in the Conservative Party, but he might. I, I think he might have a better chance on the uh, national scene to uh, win the election. I think Pierre, you know, he would be my candidate of choice. But the question is whether the rest of the Canadian population is going to go for somebody. Uh, like Pierre, somebody who's a uh, more libertarian minded, who talks about the freedom convoy and is more supportive of, uh, you know, more, more right leaning policies. Uh, it, it's a good question. We'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, personally, I think kind of the question is, I mean, you know, Jean Charest is, is very liberal. I mean, maybe not, you know, to the NDP far left of the liberal spectrum, but he, he's quite liberal. Uh, but people got to ask, well, do we want to forever be in opposition with with classical conservatives or do we just continue to liberalize ourselves until we become winnable in, uh, you know, Toronto and Montreal? But I mean, it is possible for a principled conservative to win. I like to think it's possible in, in voting for Charest. I think you're just giving up and voting for the, the same thing in a, in a, well, a smarter package than the current liberal leader anyway. Yeah, I think so too. It's, and it's really a battle for the soul of the conservative party. What's going on right now. Um, we'll have to, we'll see what uh, direction we end up going in. And if it's, if we can get, uh, you know, get a winner on the, in the next federal election, hopefully it's before 2025, we will have to see. Yeah. It's just going to be an interesting uh, process to watch. And it's such a long race. So we'll see what develops. You know, they're all just kind of putting out their platforms and policies right now. I got a feeling they'll start taking some more unique stances. That's a frustration I've had in interviewing them so far. I mean, they've been good, but very broad in their answers and, and not taking many direct stances on things. I think as it develops, we're, we're going to see them trying to differentiate each other and maybe we'll see some more uh, distinction between these candidates. For sure. Definitely keeping very vague so far. We got a, a long ways to go and I'm sure they don't want to come up with too many uh, really out there policy ideas that are going to throw people off. They're just, you know, kind of dipping their, their toes in the water and seeing, uh, seeing what, what's going to stick with people, what they want, smart moves, but as uh, you know, frustrating for you, I'm sure. Yeah, politically expedient, but I do understand it. And uh, I'll get them later. Uh, so uh, is uh, I guess, you know, thanks for coming in today. Is, what else are you working on right now? Is there stuff you can update us on before we let you go? Yeah, for sure. We got uh, another story coming up. The um, emissions reduction plan has been released, and they plan on reducing oil and gas emissions by 75% by 2030 is one of the highlights of the plan. So that's quite interesting. We'll see how that works out uh, at West probably not very happy with it if i had to guess that's a safe assumption well and, and uh, with every target they've set i believe since the 80s they have never met one yet but they could do a heck of a lot of damage trying exactly yeah and uh you know the first um uh like during the Kyoto protocol in 2002 the plans were to cut the total emissions by an average of six percent uh that only increased by one percent so you know, even if they try to really push it forward, probably not going to get near the levels they want to. Well, interesting times. I'll let you get back to watching that uh, hornet's nest in Ottawa. Then, uh, Matthew, thank you very much for checking in with us. And we'll uh, see what you got to say uh, with more stories in the future here soon. Sounds good. Thank you, Corey. Have a good one. Thanks. So, yes, that's our parliamentary bureau chief, Matthew Horwood. And, uh, yeah, there's lots going on in Ottawa, and we have him on the ground out there, and those stories are coming out. You know, we, we've been doing a lot of coverage on federal issues for a long time, but having somebody solid on the ground like this now is fantastic, and he's been doing great over there. So it's, you know, broadening our audience and our readership, and we appreciate Matthew's work. Be sure to subscribe so you can see it, so you're not stuck behind the paywall, guys. WesternStandardOnline.com slash membership. Use that coupon code TRIGGERED. And you can see all of Matthew's work, plus all the columnists and all the rest of the stuff. Uh, what's this Gary Burnett saying? Let, let this guy know all mandates are not gone. Yeah, I know they're not gone. 99% of them are. It depends on the person. 
I mean, if you're an unvaccinated person who wants to travel, you're still getting hooped right now. Uh, there's private companies that have screwed people who have decided not to get vaccinated. Uh, there are some federal pressures. There still are 99%. No, there's, there's much more than, than right. Less than 99% hanging out there. But unfortunately a reality with people in general, once it stops impacting them directly, they stop caring. So when the majority of the population is vaccinated and the majority of the restrictions have dropped, interest in taking part in the protests is going to follow up and drop with it. Though I understand some people still have some valid things to protest and I understand and I support it. Uh, but at this time, there's not as much appetite to get the, the, the bigger push. I want to see all the restrictions gone. I want to see every bit of it gone. It's done. It's over. And these guys do not want to let it go. So this battle's not finished. Part of what I'm saying as well is just that at least uh, they're setting the precedent. Uh, the government has been put on notice. If they try to bring in these things again, it's going to go bad. People are going to get furious. The, 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 the demonstrations are going to be a lot bigger and uh, a lot worse than they have been so far. So... Uh, why are people sucking politician butt? This is from Lori. Okay. What would you like? I, 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 I ask polite questions. I respect them when they come in. They're the people leading us whether we like it or not. It's not necessarily sucking their butts. But we do have to ask what they want to do. We have to get as much of an informed choice as we can when we run these leadership races. And hopefully pick the least bad of the bunch that we can. They're going to run things here for us, whether you like it or not. So let's try to control it as much as we can. There's one of the problems in Canada in general. The leadership races are on right now, and they're selling memberships like crazy. Less than 2% of the population holds a membership in any political party. You want to get these guys' ears. You want to get their attention. Join the party and take part in it. It doesn't mean you'll always win, but you'll have a much better chance than standing on the outside and just saying they're all corrupt, they're all bad, they're all the same, it's not any good. If that's the case, to give up, stay home, you're never going to win. you got to try, guys. you got to try, even if it's tough. Uh, but we keep the discussions rolling. We do what we can. Uh, it's been a, a good uh, group of people turning out. And yes, uh, the Alberta... Uh, Prosperity Project. I did talk to, talk to Dr. Modri. I'm going to have him on this Friday. Some people were asking about that. So we're going to have him on. We're going to talk about that. He's got a lot to speak of, of course, and a lot to go. Tomorrow, I'm going to have uh, Alberta MLA, Peter Guthrie. He's one of the ones who's been very critical of the UCP. You know, again, uh, they will speak up and speak uh, against their leadership at times when pushed. And uh, Mr. Guthrie is going to come on and talk to us a bit about that. He's up in Edmonton uh, because we have that leadership review going on and, and uh, some people are very upset with the constant efforts to change the rules and move the goalposts. So he's going to be on, and I'm going to have Joseph Borgo coming in. He's one of the Conservative Party of Canada uh, candidates. He's going to be in person here in studio. I believe he's from Saskatchewan, Saskatoon, I think. And uh, he's not a member of Parliament, but he's making a go for it, and we'll see how he goes there. So it's going to be another packed show tomorrow. Like I said, I do want to get as many of um, these candidates on as possible. I'd like to get every one of them if I can. And... Uh, repeatedly uh like i was talking with matthew you know their their campaigns are going to evolve they're going to change there's going to be more to talk about as we go along and as i said one way or another one of them is going to be the leader of the conservative party and it's going to impact policies in canada whether we like it or not uh so make sure again to get on there join all those social media things we're uh, on twitter now we're broadcasting to that today that's a first time for us it's a different thing and on linkedin we're on rumble make sure to like and share on all of those things guys that's how we can get out there and spread the word and beat the mainstream legacy media who will not touch the issues on your behalf. So uh, that's what I've got today, guys. Thank you very much for joining me. It was a good full show and I got another one coming tomorrow. I will see you then at 1130 AM.